Welcome to session one of Torrent 2019. In this session, we're hearing from guest speaker Mark Wargo. Pastor Mark Wargo is lead pastor of Cross Current Church in Port Huron, Michigan, and author of Beyond Betrayal. Hello, everybody. Let's just get the particulars out of the way. It is hot. How'd you know back home, tonight is going to be a low of 43. I saw 90s and I was like, oh my gosh. I said, can I preach in 70s basketball shorts? And he's like, absolutely not. So I wore a long sleeve, you know, but we're here. It is so good to be with, but it is hot. That ain't right. That ain't God. It should be really easy for you guys to get people saved. <laughs> be like, you know how hot it is out here? Hell? I want Jesus, you know. <laughs> so, I'm in. It'd be really, really, really easy. I, I'm so glad to be here, honored to be with you guys. And uh, I get to travel with my son now and go places, and it's just a blast watching him do what he does. In fact, his bride back home is actually leading worship for the house back home. And so we divided and conquered and uh, just love, love who he is and love who he's become and can't wait for grandchildren. <clears throat> Was that on live stream? Yes, Amanda. <laughs> So as I was uh, worshiping, I wanted to uh, share with you just something that dro the Lord dropped in my heart for this house and uh, for the pastors, and I'll probably tackle it a little more this week, but I saw this word kind of just scroll, uh, scroll across my heart as worship was going on, and I saw the word uh, forerunners, and, um, and I thought about that for your leaders, and obviously your leaders are forerunners. And there's a lot of things that are going on. And sometimes when you're in the trenches, you don't really see what God sees until he brings fresh eyes into the pictures and picture and kind of reminds you or, re, you know, lets you see what's really going on in the bigger realm. And back home, I'm in the trenches playing general contractor for an expansion, you know, running the church, doing all these things. And sometimes I don't see what's going on until a guy like Pastor Chad or somebody comes in and he, they, they begin to speak to me about, man, there's some stuff going on here. And sometimes you're in it. You, know, you understand what I mean, right? Yeah. <clears throat> you're in it so you don't see it. And so when that word forerunner popped up, I thought, man, that's pretty cool. I'll share that with Chad and Melinda. And, um, but I don't think it's just for them. I think there's a forerunner spirit in this house. And yeah. And so what I, what I saw, and there's obvious picture of what's going on, but some of you don't realize how important and how precedent, unprecedented what uh, you are doing right now, the things you are doing. You see, you're taking years of history, and you're rewriting it. You're taking words that leaders and people have said would never be done, and you're making it happen. Now, that's exciting, isn't it? Yeah. It's exciting to have happen, but it's pretty frustrating when you don't know and have a map in front of you. Yeah. And don't be like, well, I got a Bible. No, 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 no. When you don't have a map in front of you. And so what this church is doing is you are in a field of weeds with no path. And it'd be really easy to step out of the unknown and go over here and follow another path that's already been blazed. But God hasn't called you guys to do that. So what he's done, and he's called multi-generations into this church. He's called multi-cultures into this church. He's called multi-denominations into this church to create one trail for the next generation. <clears throat> so you, you might be thinking, while I'm here just to be here, I like this church, I like church worship, I like when pastor jumps around on the front, and you know, I like eating every week, communion, you know, whatever has drawn, whatever has brought you into the church, you know, you're like, well, I like that, 
But I want you to know that there is a, a reason why you are here. There's a, there's a specific plan that God is doing. And sometimes when you're in trenches, you don't see. So let me just kind of show you and, and kind of let you know that there is a bigger picture than what we see, than what you might see. And so when I say multi-generation, multicultural, multi-denomination, this is becoming more and more and more a picture of heaven. It's beautiful. And so I just say to the leadership, and not just <clears throat> Pastor Chad and Melinda, although to them, but to the leaders of the house, when you're blazing your trail, you're not constantly swinging the machete to knock down the weeds. There are timely swings that the Father's going to bring. And there's somebody, sometimes you don't know, is it right? Is it left? Do we continue to go straight? And all it is is weeds and trees. But I'm telling you, when it's all said and done, you're going to look back and go, holy moly, look at how faithful he was. Holy moly, look at the timely provision. Look at the timely dollar. Look at the timely person. Look at the timely anointing. Look at the timely door to be opened. But God's not calling the leaders just to swing. He's calling us to swing. Amen. Forerunners. Forerunners, forerunners, forerunners in this house. Booyah, booyah, booyah. So I want to talk this morning about this word that's really been uh, strong on my heart for the past six months for the church. And so um, what I have found is I, I found that there's a lot of people who have, um, have had one time, you know, been expecting and throughout time, either their expector has broke or it's kind of lost a little of the passion and the zeal. And hopefully I can, over the next few minutes, speak something that the Holy Spirit can kind of maybe awaken on the inside and allow for expectancy to come alive at a greater level. So I want to start out by saying that expectancy is not God's responsibility, it's ours. It's ours. <clears throat> How many of you have ever been expecting something <laughs> from the Lord? Yeah. How many mothers in the house? <laughs> you were expecting at one time, <clears throat> right? Now let me ask a serious, serious question. How many mothers have had a miscarriage? So you know the disappointment of expectancy. And you know the fears and trepidation of the next pregnancy. Because we've had five of them. We've had one where we actually delivered in the bathroom, two of them, just her and I. And so the issue is, there's, I don't know if there's a person alive who hasn't had expectancy disappointed at some level, at some, you know, parts of the, part of their life. How many of you have ever been hurt by somebody in leadership in a church? If it's here, don't raise your hand. Because I know that didn't happen. <clears throat> a to the men. How many of you have ever been betrayed? How many of you have been through divorce? We can go down the list. Or how, there are, uh, life is full of those moments where we have this expectancy, but yet sometimes we, because of delays, because of disappointment, right? Because of those things, we become disillusioned to the fact that, well, maybe, maybe God didn't speak that. To begin with, or maybe I didn't hear him correctly to begin with. And so today what I want to do is all I want to do is kind of maybe stir up this environment of expectancy. There was a story. In fact, I, I went through some quotes. I, I like to research quotes on expectancy. Let me just uh, read these and see if they encourage you a little bit, right? Hoping for the best, but expecting for the worst. Come on, put that on a t-shirt. Now, we may not say that because we're faith people and because we're spirit-filled people, but in our hearts. I'm talking, not talking about just in our, our, bless you, brother. I'm not talking about just this, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Somebody said that to me one time at church, and I said, oh, you're stressed. <laughs> No, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Oh, no, you're just lying. Seriously, you're lying. 
It's the truth, right? We just don't want to admit when we're stressed. How would we just say it? Man, I am stinking stressed. Well, you're not relying on Jesus. No, Jesus has me on the ledge of being overwhelmed many times. Anybody with me today? If you haven't been on the ledge of overwhelmed with Jesus, you're probably not following him. Because if you got all those people that are hungry out there and you only got a few fishes and loaves, that's overwhelmed. So the issue is this expectancy, and we have this mindset sometimes that we, we can't really get to the table of realness, and the only way you get the breakthrough is by being real. Yeah. Yeah. And so the mentality, hoping for the best, expecting the worst, is maybe not something you speak, but it's what a lot of people believe. Yeah. This is why our expectancy is not to capacity. This is why our expectancy doesn't release in passion and zeal. And our prayers are more like, well, God, I pray you would just, you know, at least show up this morning. You see what I'm saying? Our prayers reveal where our level of expectancy is. Well, God, I just, you know, as a pastor, you're like, God, I just hope that there's more full seats than empty. You know what I mean? And so when you're expecting low, it's almost like, oh, God, I prayed the offering. When it comes in, oh, at least pay the electric bill. <laughs> and what happens is you get to that place of you think you're praying at a level of expectancy, but you're really praying at a level that you can do. Because yeah. if you're a called communicator, you're going to have some people that show up. Are you with me today, right? And so the level of expectancy of being able to pray was pray at a level that only God can show up and do. Amen. And so, the, the, so these quotes are, are really funny. One is, um, expecting is my crime, disappointment is my punishment. <laughs> now there's a tattoo. <laughs> expecting is my crime, disappointment, my punishment. Boom. <laughs> But here's one, I, and I feel it will minister to somebody this morning. It's expectation is the root of all disappointment. So in Luke chapter 8, Jesus is on a boat with his guys. And so I'll read through some of this. It says, they, they, in verse 26, it says, They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which, across, which is across the lake from Galilee, When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. Now, this is an interesting story because I'm kind of like the personality. I like to dive into these stories, and I like to picture myself there. So I'm on the boat with Jesus, and we're crossing over. Jesus is napping, right? And the storm appears. And Jesus comes and speaks to the storm. So we got one major storm that went on. And then we say, whew, Jesus calmed the storm. And then we show up. And now I got a naked man running after me. (laughs) How many are like, wasn't expecting that? (laughs) I mean, could you imagine? You're tired. Jesus got the nap. The guy's awake get out of the boat, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm I'm going back to Galilee. (laughs) Hey, get out of the boat, this naked man, could you almost hear the chariots of fire music going on? (laughs) Dun, 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 (laughs) dun. How many would admit that's just simply not right? Some of you are like, what is he doing? I'm explaining you real stories here in the Bible. A naked man running. Slow motion. Not right. With demons. It's bad enough running without demons, but when you're running with demons, everything's just all cray-cray. This guy runs up to Jesus, and 
The Bible says, and when he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of most high God? And he began to beg them, right? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus has commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized the man, and though he was chained hand and foot, kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Now, could you imagine him going and visit Grandpa at the tombs? <laughs> and this guy be jumping out, be, Whoa! <laughs> be like, I ain't doing that anymore. I'll email him. I mean, this is reality, right? This is real stuff. It's like you'd be drawing straws to see who's going to go visit because there's just some wacko man out there. Now, if you know the story, you know that, the, you know, it wasn't just one demon. It was many. It was legion. And it was a large herd of pigs that Jesus made the demons go into. I have a problem with that. Because I love bacon. <laughs> How many like bacon in the house? You know, thick bacon with a crunchy edge and a little chew to it. That's a lot. Of, that's a lot of bacon. But an interesting thing that happened is this guy that everybody knew about that was jacked up, that was demonically oppressed, that had all these issues going on. Jesus shows up, it makes the demons go in the pig, the pig go down in the water, they drown, all that kind of stuff. And then the people hear about it. And I was amazed as I began to read through this thing, that in verse 37, upon hearing what was going on, this whole area, all the garrisons knew about this guy. Upon hearing about this guy getting set free and no longer being naked, but the Bible says now sitting at the feet of Jesus, they come to Jesus with all this excitement and all this anticipation and all this, what's next? And in verse 37, it says, then all the people of the region of the garrison asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and he left. I find this interesting because I don't think the fear was a fear that he was going to cast demons out of them. I feel like I I really look at this from everyday life, and I think the fear was that Jesus was going to disrupt their everyday life. I feel like they were Jesus was going to come in and disrupt their mindsets. And disrupt their flows. And disrupt the way they did things. The way they thought. And they asked Jesus to leave. And Jesus leaves. And even the demon guy. The demon, uh, demonic guy 38 says that he wanted to follow Jesus. And go with Jesus. And Jesus said no. No, no. You're going to stay here. And I want you to just go around and share your story. Isn't it sad that the king of kings would show up. Right? The Son of God would show up here and do something that nobody was able to do prior. And because of a fear of disruption, said, you got to go. You got to go. Now, I'm thankful for the grace of God. How many is thankful for the grace of God? But isn't it sad that these people who apparently needed Jesus was left an evangelist? And I have a feeling that God wanted to leave so much more. You see, you can, you can be left. God's grace is so good, even when you deny him and you have an attitude towards him, he'll leave you something because he loves you that much. He's that good. But God's intention was to bring that city so much more. You see, what I see here is I see a group of people who just got very comfortable and lost the art and heart of expectancy. They didn't want change. They were okay with having a naked guy running around in their city scaring a bunch of people and freaking a bunch of people out. They were okay with that. It says that Jesus, you got to go. I want to see what happens because environments of expectancy 
Again, are not God's responsibility. They are ours. Whether it's in the church, whether it's at the address you live, or whether it's at the work you live, or the business you own, or whatever it be the case, expectancy is our deal. And so what happens, this is really intriguing. It says in verse 39, return home. This is Jesus talking to the demonic guy. Return home. Tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Thank God he left an evangelist, but man, he wanted to leave so much more. But in verse 40, immediately following, now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him for they were all expecting him. I want you to get this picture just for a moment. Jesus shows up in a place where people weren't expecting. They didn't even know pretty much he was going to show up. He just shows up. He just, you know, speaks to the water, speaks to the storm, shows up. The naked man runs up. Next thing you know, he's set free. Pigs are dying, and this guy's clothed. That is quite a scene. If I came to your house and I cast a bunch of demons into your pigs, you'd be like, dude. That ain't cool. <laughs> but then they ask him to leave, and he shows up, and he shows up at this one place, and they're all expecting. Can you get this environment of expectancy? Yeah. You see, I, I, I've, I've read this story millions of times since the Lord began to put this on my heart. I'm telling over and over and over, and I'm like, Father, they were expecting him, but they didn't know when he was going to return. They didn't have access to his Google calendar. <laughs> There's nowhere written where it says, Jesus says, well, I'm just going to go over there and come right back. It could have been days that he was there. Could you imagine if there was an environment of expectancy in the garrison land? Jesus could have been there for weeks and months, and they would still be standing there expecting. Yeah. The Bible says that when he then... When he returned, a crowd welcomed him. I'm telling you, there's something about a crowd with a heart of expectancy. A crowd with a heart of expectancy. He stood there. I can almost see this picture. Not almost. I can see this picture. A couple of guys standing on the shore. And a couple of ladies show up and a couple of kids. What are you looking at, Daddy? Jesus. I'm expecting Jesus. Well, what do you mean you're expecting? Oh, yeah, I'm expecting him to show up in our family, in that healing, in our finances, in the generational sins, in our generational curses. He's, I'm expecting. Really? That's pretty cool. I don't even know what that means, but I'll expect with you. So now we got multi-generations standing on the shore saying, we don't even know what's going to happen, but we're looking. And all these people are causing all kinds of noise back there. And you're like, man, shut up. And you're like, let's go. And all of a sudden, somebody says, there's a black dot. Is that, no, it's a tree. No. No. And then somebody with good eyes finally says, no, it's Jesus. <laughs> right? You know, when you get 42 and you're like, have to start wearing readers or increasing the font size on your paper. <laughs> and you see the black dot and there's like this, yep, I, I think that's him. Oh, it is him. It is him. And you can feel this swell of excitement, this swell of, what is he going to do? Yeah. This swell of, is this my day? This anticipation, and the crowd increases and increases and increases so much to the point where they begin to push the people on the front line into the water a little bit, and it's like, come on, stop pushing. No, we all expecting. There may not be room on the front line, but we all expecting here. And the closer he got, could you imagine? I don't know if it got quieter or if it got louder. Because if you read the story and you continue to read it, it said that the crowd almost swallowed Jesus up, right? It almost, it just engulfed him so much because you don't know what it was like. But I'm telling you that with this environment of expectancy, 
miracles begin to break out. A lady who was bleeding for nine years, out of money, weak, and all this stuff, had issues and was outcast to society in an environment of expectancy, got an attitude and said, I'm going to press past the noise, and I'm going to press past the stuff, and I'm just going to touch this man's garment. That's all I want to do, is I want to touch this man's garment. And of all those people touching Jesus, he felt power release out of him from a tiny, sick outcasted woman in an environment of expectancy. I think about this often. I think about, God, am I just a noisemaker or am I drawing power from you? Am I drawing power from you or am I just making noise? Then this girl that's supposed to die gets healed, doesn't die. That's just the stories we read about. What about out of that environment of expectancy, homes were changed? What about the homes that were were impacted, the single moms that were impacted, the single dads, the generations that were impacted and said, wow, there was something different when Jesus showed up on the shore. It was like, we didn't want to see him go, but when he came back, man, we were pumped again and there was some kind of expectancy and could there have been more miracles that we don't read about? I think there very well could have been because if you had all the miracles, you don't have enough book to contain how much Jesus actually did. How many marriages were put back together because of that one instance of expectancy? How many relationships were restored? How many kids were returned back to the father? How many fathers returned back to the kids? I mean, you don't know. We don't know. But I can guarantee there was an impact that was greater than just a daughter that was raised up and a woman that was healed. An environment of expectancy. Jesus didn't sound a horn on the boat saying, I'm coming. You better be expecting. (laughs) Jesus was drawn to an environment of expectancy. Asked to leave in an area where he wanted to release all of heaven. But was asked to leave and was drawn to a place of expectancy. Ever since I started preaching this thing, I've had so many opportunities, whether it's finances or people or things, or where we're just about to open a facility on expansion of the church here in the end of June. And it's like all these different opportunities. And I, I find myself saying, when I don't have an answer, okay, Jesus, I'm on the shore. I'm on the shore. And I'm expecting. I'm on the shore. <clears throat> And I'm expecting. I was talking to a, a pastor just a couple weeks ago about this idea of expectancy. He goes, he goes, <clears throat> I've gotten so accustomed to what I do, my expectancy has just become numb. Just become numb. I've lost a passion. I've lost a zeal. I've lost a stuff. And he says, it's just, I've just become numb. And you know what? We can dance, we can sing, we can shout, we can lift our hands up, and I encourage all that, right? (laughs) We can go to church, we can do those things, but yet when you get in your car and you have to go to your address, that's where the environment matters. When you look at your checkbook, That's where the environment matters. When you look at your son or your daughter who has possibly walked away from the Lord for a season, for a season, I'm going to tell you, God has your child. That's where it matters. When you're in a situation that you can't do anything about, that's when it's time to just push people aside a little bit and get to the shore and be like, all right, I'm standing on the shore and I am expecting I'm expecting, I'm expecting, I'm expecting, I'm standing on the shore, and I'm expecting, I'm standing on the shore, and I'm expecting, because when we go numb, 
Like, you know, when we start to lose that, we, we, we find ourselves way back here. And we're like, well, pastor can expect for me. Or that guy looks really spiritual. So he, kind of like, well, I hope he shows up. I hope he does stuff. I, I wish he would do something for me. And what expectancy does, expectancy will lessen and take the power out of your disappointments and delays. It removes the power of the disappointment. I say this because I used to be married to disappointment. And I don't mean my wife, Tracy. <laughs> Just in case if you're watching, baby. <clears throat> now, that woman was a divine appointment. But I used to be married to disappointment. I expected, listen, this is my, was my mentality, was I was waiting for God to pull the carpet out from underneath me. Whenever good news would show up, I was waiting for something bad to happen to offset that. That's the kind of storm I was going through. And I had to learn not just the art of expectancy, I had to learn the heart of expectancy again. And that is I refuse to allow that disappointment to hang anymore. I say this and I preach this and I live this that if God never answers another prayer for me again, I have enough to praise him for the rest of my life. Amen. So therefore, I have nothing to be disappointed about. But yet I'm still standing on the shore because could there be a possibility that he would still want to do something that is greater than I could ever imagine or something I could ever think? Could there be a possibility that the blazing this trail, that I'm not at the end of it, but I'm just at the beginning of it? Could it be that there's something more that I can bring to the table to help advance the kingdom? Could it be that all the disappointments and all the delays could turn for the glory of God so that it could create a citywide revolution of expectancy and miracles? Could it be that in, ten, that in VC2 that God could take a bunch of disappointments delayed issues and cause a divine appointment to come into play to advance the kingdom of God and change the course of history. I stand on the shore. Jesus, listen, it only takes one to spark expectancy, but it takes multiple people to create that citywide environment. I'm wondering if there's one person that's willing to push past through the noise, push through the stuff, and say, get out of my way, pastor. I'm on the shore. Get out of my way, pastor. Pastor, you know what? You're not the only one that's going to live with expectancy. I got your back, bro. This is it. Somebody like, well, you don't know the amount of disappointment I've had. You don't know the amount of delays. You don't know the amount of issues I had. Hey, let's go out to coffee. We'll share stories. You'll probably be like, I'm surprised you're still saved. One thing happened, I, and we don't know. We don't know if it was one person that sparked a large crowd of people and created an environment of expectancy, or if it was multiple people. We don't know. But what we do know is that somebody's expectancy became contagious. And out of that contagious expectancy created multiple miracles for multiple people. You see that expectancy that comes from the inside. That's one of those things that has to lean into the face of the unknown and lean into the face of the awkward and lean into the face of fairness. No one's ever been there before. And lean into the face of that, 
I've tried that before. I don't know if I want to try it again. I touched that electric fence, and you know what? It didn't happen. And I, I swung the machete, and nothing happened. And Maybe you're a single mom and you're like, you've just been beat down. And, and maybe you're a single dad and you've been beat down. Maybe you're a business guy and you, you've tried four times and your business continues to fail. Does that mean you're done? Heck no, you're not dead, you're not done. So get back on the shore. Get back on the shore. We had these prophetic guys in our city that were prophesying over our church when we were going through the worst storms possible. And they were saying, cross current is going down. Cross current Ichabod is written on the doorpost of that church. And that simply means the glory of God has departed. And I remember hearing that. People were coming up and saying that. And I said, not on my watch. Because I'm a fighter. My favorite movie is Rocky. All of a sudden, I heard Mickey, which was Holy Spirit, saying, get up. Get up. Get up. Maybe Holy Spirit is telling you in that voice of Mickey, get up. Get up. Get up to the shore. I know you're scared. Get up to the shore. I know you're nervous. Get up to this. I know the thoughts of, man, well, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? Yeah, let me ask you, what if? Yeah. Yeah. What if, if this was the time? What if this was the season? What if you were just a little premature and stepping out and this is the now? What if? What if? What if? What if? What if? Not what if bad things. What if yeah. this? is the day what if what if I just found out this last week my mother possibly has lung cancer and at first I was like you know bummed and all that kind of stuff and I still am bummed right you gotta love mom I love mom and I thought you know what and her and I have these conversations if the Lord takes her home, we still going to go down swinging. Are you okay with that? Yeah. We're still standing on the shore together saying, come on, Jesus. We believe you can speak to that erratic cell and you can cause that thing to come into alignment. We just happen to believe these things. It's not these things where we're sitting back just saying, oh, yeah, see, there's another thing carpet pulled out from underneath us again and there's God he must not like us he must be mad at me no man we're standing at the shore we're standing at the shore we got some things at the church I'm sure father's probably like okay I believe you you're standing at the shore already you know it's like because I keep telling him okay God I'm at the shore and I'm expecting I'm at the shore and I'm expecting I'm at the shore, and I'm expecting. You know what's really cool about that? Is that my mindset and my heart has changed. Because in the beginning, when you re-engage in expectancy, it's all about the answered prayer. And what Father wants to take us to is forget the answered prayer. Look at the one who could bring the answer. And I don't want to stand on the shore just so Jesus can come answer one of my prayers. I want to have him in the midst. I want to have an expectancy because I don't know when he's coming back from the garrisons. If they don't want him, we'll take him. I just want him in my neighborhood. I want him in where I'm at. Expectancy. Can we just bow our heads real quick together? I got a real simple question for you. Has your 
is your expector. I don't even know if that's a word. But is that expectancy on the inside of you become numb? Is it broke? Has it gotten to the mindset like the garrisons where it says, this is just the way it's always going to be? Because, man, I just want to speak life. Almost like the Lord I see putting a defibrillator on that expector. Clear! Clear! today and you say, Pastor, I need a touch in that area of expectancy. And today, I'm moving back to the shore and I'm going to stay there until my Savior, until my King, until my big brother shows up. If that's you today, can you slip your hand up where you are so I know who I'm praying for. up. It's not just so I can see it. It's your hands up. You and Jesus. It's almost like you're seeing yourself on the shore now waving, saying, Jesus, I'm here. I'm standing on the shore, Jesus. I'm standing on the shore. I've become numb. I, I got disappointed. I got delayed. But here I am today. I'm re-engaging in it today. My expectancy. My expectancy. My expectancy, even if you don't answer it the way I think you should answer, I don't care. I'm expecting today my Savior to arrive back in to where I live, back in to where I am. It's not always going to be this way. I'm not going to settle just for status quo. This is what we're expecting today. We're expecting more of you. We're going to continue to blaze this trail. We're going to continue to knock down the weeds and the trees together today. Expectancy. There's somebody here I just want to speak to today. That disappointment that you have carried for years, and that thing has been like a taproot in your heart. I speak to that thing today, and like Jesus, I call that thing to shrivel up and die, to lose its power to lose its authority in your life, to lose that place. Come on, see him reach down and pulling that tap root up. How you see God, how you see the world, how you see life is going to begin to change because you have filtered everything through that tap root. Disappointment has got to go. Disappointment has got to leave. Somebody needs to hear this. You're not behind. You're not on the outside looking in. You believe it or not, you're smack dab right in the middle of God's perfect plan for your life. It doesn't look like it because the waves are rushing in. It doesn't look like it because there's a naked man around. I mean, but I want to tell you, you're right smack dab in the middle of God's perfect plan. Speak life to that expectancy. Life. Hope in all things. Life. Vitality. Passion to come alive in you. Silence the voices and look. Silence the voices and get to the edge of the shore. Begin to create your environment. In Jesus' name.
Thank you for joining us at VC2, where we're real people meeting real needs with the reality of Christ. If you haven't already, subscribe so you don't miss out on what's happening here at VC2. Also, check us out on Instagram and Facebook as VC2 Online.